Um, welcome everyone to our April AZ Bio Peer session. Today we're going to be talking about um, talent and specifically training your teams by building in house programs. And we're thrilled to have a great moderator and some experts to share with you today. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jim and take it away. Great. Thank you, Joe. Um, as for myself, uh, this is a passion of mine, talent development, uh, building talent. I spent about half my career with a global healthcare company developing uh, new products, new drugs, uh, launching in new markets. And the other half has been focused on startups. So how do you commercialize a new technology uh, into the healthcare space? Um, one point that I, I think is very important, I think when you have a discussion about talent management, I've often said it's, it's really like if you use the analogy of construction, you have to have a great strategy, you have to have a great blueprint, because you need to understand what you're going to build. And I likened that to, uh, you know, training dozens of great carpenters only to find out that the, the building you're going to build is made of concrete, glass and steel. So you have some very talented people, but they don't fit. So I often remind people, you have to be very much focused on your strategy, current strategy and where you're going. And then also think about geography. Is it just for a regional market, a US marketplace, US Europe, rest of the world? I mean, all those things have to be pulled into consideration, but I think it really starts with that blueprint. And as an organization, and this is more than just human resources, I think every department needs to understand the importance of learning and developing their people. So I think that's a little background on me. And uh, currently, by the way, I head up a, a spin out from Arizona State University called Ordinatrix. We have a proteomics platform. It's used by researchers for drug discovery, biomarker discovery, you know, a very exciting uh, technology that's really at the forefront of pushing personalized medicine. And uh, I've been at that for a couple of years now. That's it for me. Hi, um, thank you very much, um, uh, Jim, for the introduction, and and uh, and Joan for uh, for asking me to participate today. Um, so I'm Kristen Swingle. I am um, the Chief Operating Officer for Critical Path Institute. I'm also serving um, currently as interim president for CPATH. Um, I joined CPATH in July of 2019, and prior to uh, joining CPATH, I was with uh, Core Blood Registry. So I, uh, I held various positions at, at CBR um, over my almost 14 years there, um, but in, in, within the, the scope of my responsibilities um, was overseeing our Tucson facility um, and stem cell operations uh, as well. You know, what that included was um, uh, manufacturing, quality regulatory, um, and all of the kind of associated support functions that, that go with, um, with managing that operation. So, um, I, uh, I'm happy to be here today. I have, you know, the, the environments um, at CBR and, um, and CPATH are quite different, um, but um, at, the, at the heart of it, you know, I do believe that, that training and workforce development is, is pretty, pretty crucial to ensuring that um, the organization's needs are met and the individual employee's needs are met. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, thanks to uh, Joan for inviting me to participate. Uh, looking forward to um, the discussion. Uh, I'm Chris Yu. I'm CEO of Yu and Company Accelerators. It's the new accelerator downtown in Phoenix, where we're focused on companies at the intersection of healthcare, life sciences, and technology. Um, I have held various management roles in startups, as well as worked at companies, large ones like IBM, and have um, spent the past 30 years or so uh, trying to uh, focus on how do you enable disruption without disrupting too many people and making their jobs a nightmare, which technology often seems to do. Um, I think we can all agree that we have a love-hate relationship with technology. And so part of this is, is how do you ensure that um, workers are able to be um, kind of integrated into the workforce um, and become knowledge workers of the future? And that training and the programs that are necessary are things that I think we'll have to all pay attention to, um, especially in this industry where uh, being technically proficient is very important. Um, so I've run um, internship programs uh, and have hired really 
um, amazing people. And I think there's there's some lessons learned, I think, in that process that would love to, you know, see if it's something that others have seen and uh, share those experiences with you. Great, thank you so much. I thank both of you. Um, why don't we jump right into the first question? You know, what are the what's the main goal you have for your in-house training programs? So, you know, Chris, why don't you just kick it off? Yeah, sure. So the most uh, recent uh, experience was a company called Systems Imagination. It was a big data analytics company, uh, recently acquired by Systems Oncology, a, an oncology biotechnology company. And um, I can proudly say that, you know, we always ran as a small team, never larger than 15 people. Um, but the summers we became 28 or 30. Uh, and over the span of six years, um, we hired in um, most of our talent through our internship program. We created summer internship programs where students from ASU and all over the world actually ended up coming to learn how to deal with big data, um, how to analyze it, and how to actually interact in a team setting um, to solve you know, these challenging questions of what do you do with information that's at scale from an industry like the life sciences. Um, and I think the purpose, the main purpose of these training programs um, are to provide the company with an extra lens on an individual that they might wanna hire and to create partnerships and relationships with the ecosystem and the community, um, especially in, 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 the, in our case, knowledge workers, right? Um, having people who are very good at data interact with people who are very good at the bench is, is challenging. They speak different languages and trying to put them together in the same place and enable them to function in a very productive way. These kind of internships that we put together, they represent training, which allows um, people from these two different worlds to come together and communicate and be productive together. So that's really been the main you know, purpose of the training programs that we've run. Great, uh, Kristen? Yes. Yeah, so as, as I mentioned, you know, my, the, the two most recent organizations are kind of different in um, the, the skill sets of the workforce. And so with Core Blood Registry, you know, with that being a true kind of operations and manufacturing environment, um, and it's an FDA regulated manufacturing environment, you know, a, a, a real focus of the training programs were to ensure consistency of process, to ensure best practice, you know, quality, efficiency, um, really making sure that um, there's as much consistency in the end product as we are able to impart as a, as a sample um, makes its way through the process. Um, and so we really took on making sure that we were, um, through our in-house training programs, um, providing those best practices and providing the, the, the guidelines to ensure that level of quality and, um, and consistency. With, um, with Core Blood Registry, uh, or sorry, with, uh, with Critical Path Institute, um, you know, th this is an environment with um, highly educated um, uh, individuals and the, um, the, the public-private partnerships that are focused around um, specific disease areas um, and the programs that we have in advanced um, data collaboration and data analysis, quantitative medicine, you know, a lot of those individuals obviously come into the organization with the skills, the technical skills and the background to be able to um, be successful in their individual area of focus. Um, but as an organization where we can really focus our, um, our efforts for an in-house training program is you know, we, we are a growing organization. So making sure that um, our, our team members have the, um, the softer skills, making sure that they have um, leadership development opportunities, making sure that they understand what their career progression looks like. Um, that, that is a focus for our, for our in-house training programs, um, primarily at CPATH. So for both of you, to what extent did you rely 100%? And in house training, or did you utilize some external programs or expertise to, to accomplish your goals? So uh, with, with, with CBR, um, it was almost exclusively in-house training. Um, we did um, occasionally bring in outside trainers 
um, or send um, send individuals to um, to workshops so that they could bring that information back. We actually had a the benefit of having a full training team, um, a train the trainer program, um, kind of a full competency um, uh, evaluation uh, program. So um, we were pretty lucky in that regard. Um, we had to build it from the ground up, but it was something that really evolved into into something really effective for the organization. Um, for CPATH, I would say we it's it's almost exclusively um, external training. So and now that said, bringing in external trainers or um, or utilizing um, webinars, conferences, um, things of that nature to really kind of round out the the skill sets and the training for individuals. Yeah, I yeah. would um, second that in that uh, you know it's kind of a mix of internal and external. Um, and it really very much depends on the purpose of the program itself. When you're when you're looking at, for example, an internship program, um, there are a bunch of uh, reasons why you want to have a good view on are individuals a good fit for the company, right? And so the the kinds of programs that we would have involve both, you know, um, um, external training in areas such as project management. Um, we would actually put them through courses uh, hosted by PMI, uh, the Project Management Institute, um, because those were skills that they needed to get their um, team project done, for example, um, or internally just having someone shadow an executive um, for a couple of weeks to learn what it's like to be inside of a startup, interfacing with clients, uh, working on uh, projects that change rapidly. I think those are those are both very necessary, both internal and external resources. Great. And a question to both of you, is this organization wide where training and development is critical or do you focus on certain functions, certain roles, or how, how do you put together a development plan say across your organization? Yeah, maybe I'll jump in first there. Um, I think Kristen said it right, which is there are some soft skills that I think we don't pay a lot of attention to uh, just in general, um, in training the next generation of knowledge workers, um, those soft skills need to come from both, you know, external and internal sources. Um, and I think tracking how people are developing culturally within an organization are, is critical. And that, that's an organization-wide um, need. That's an organization-wide push that, that I think all companies should focus on. It isn't that the culture needs to be the sole goal, right? The company's goal is to do what the company does, but um, understanding how individuals fit within a culture of a company, um, I think that's part of the training can help with that. Training programs can really help assist with um, kind of integrating new workers better. Yeah, agreed. So, you know, to build on that, I I really think any role in an organization um, is uh, is one that um, should you know be actively participating in in training programs. I think the structure and the type of training may may vary, but I, I do believe that every single role in an organization should continue to um, grow and develop. Um, I uh, you know I, I found myself um, it's really effective for me to be in um, in 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 training uh, as as a leader in the organization. It helps me to fully understand what I am asking others to take on. Um, it helps me to be more attuned to what is going on for them and um, and and be able to um, better advocate or better communicate with um, with uh, with my colleagues. Um, I also think you know we're in a very rapidly um, evolving field, and so one of the one of the things that I you know attributes that I believe is most um, important for organizations like ours is to constantly be innovating and learning. And I think that if at all levels of the organization individuals are participating in some form of training or development, it helps to really kind of keep that at the forefront that we don't stay stagnant, that we we do continue to learn. Um, I do believe, you know, there, there are, you know, depending on the, the role and the, um, you know, what the kind of objective of that um, position is and, and what that person is kind of doing in day in and day out, you know, the focus and, and, and what type of training they're participating in um, shifts over time, you know, they're the, they're, you know, it's, I think it's really important that 
that um, technicians have the opportunity to um, participate in aseptic technique training and really any kind of process that requires um, uh, you know, practice or demonstrated competency to just kind of get comfortable with process, that sort of thing, really important to ensure that there's adequate training so that there's that level of comfort and confidence to really deliver on what they are at being asked to do. We have to, as leaders, we have to give everybody, ensure everybody has the skills and the confidence to be able to deliver what we're asking them to deliver. Um, and so I think that, um, I think that having the opportunity to um, have, you know, really kind of structured training programs that set them up for success is very important. Um, when it comes to the leadership and soft skills, you know, while, um, I'll, I'll just speak on, on, this, on the critical path side, you know, I've, I'm working with, um, you know, tremendously competent individuals um, who, who all come from um, prior organizations where they also have had the opportunity potentially to have gone through um, some form of uh, skills training, leadership training, um, you know, get, having development in certain competencies. And I think that that's great that everybody has some baseline I think where there's an opportunity um, for organizations with training programs, you know, providing training programs is it allows um, individuals to understand how your organization thinks about leadership and skills. It provides a common kind of language or standard for your organization. So even if they've had, um, you know, training in how to deal with conflict in, in prior, you know, prior, had the prior opportunities to do that how we're going to do that in this organization so that everybody is is kind of in, in lockstep i think is 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 an advantage it helps to it helps to set an organizational expectation yeah great point uh a question is in terms of what are the most critical training components for your organization whether it's a skill set or knowledge and is it something like uh quality control or regulatory, those kind of environmental things. So what are the priorities in your groups and what are the ones that are most challenging for you to get across to your team? Yeah, for um, kind of the areas where, where we work, it is about data. So understanding how to deal with data. Um, data has a life cycle. It's, it's uh, you know, we think that, um, you know, we create it, we generate it, we transform it, we share it, and we, we destroy it. But actually, data is, is pretty much, I would say, it's it, once, once you realize that data is just the way that we perceive things, it's, it's not necessarily something that you yourself can control. Um, I think we're learning that as we go, right? Um, we think we can destroy data, but it actually lives on, <laughs> as many people are finding out. Um, and so understanding how you deal with data and, and your relationship as a, an employee or a worker at a company with data, I think is, is a key skill that, um, again, the knowledge workers of the future and, and every industry is generating knowledge now, right? It's, it's what you do with it, what's the context and how you interpret it, uh, how you use it. I think that that key skill is something that uh, training programs need to you know, have as, as part of their curriculum. The other thing I'll note is, um, as Kristen was uh, mentioning, I think training to many people has a, a negative connotation. I think it's, it's looked upon as a, oh man, I got to do this, right? Rather than a, hey, this is an opportunity for me to learn. Um, I think all of us know that, that, that working with data is challenging, um, and especially in a highly technical field like healthcare life sciences. Um, I think figuring out how to encourage people to see training as ways for their career to advance more quickly and have more satisfaction in what they do, I think would be also a key thing for programs to um, have as part of their, their you know, curriculum. So I think that's, for me, um, uh, those are two key objectives that, that um, training should have. Hey, Chris, just a quick follow on. Do you have a HIPAA compliance component to that? Do you have a privacy yeah. component to that? Yeah. So, so in our internship programs, for example, um, we actually had our, our um, trainees, we'll call them our interns, um, dealing with customer data. And so before they can touch customer data, which includes, you know, pharmaceutical company data, they had to go through um, several days worth of here are the things you need to know when you handle information that is protected. 
Um, and that is a key, you know, again, a, another key feature of why you have to um, be exposed to this in a normal work environment. In a, for example, a school setting, you wouldn't necessarily have those as concerns, but as you come into the workforce, those are um, important considerations. Great, thanks. Kristen, back to you. So what are the critical skills or knowledge components to your, your businesses yeah. and how do you handle it? So I, it, um, it's a good question. You know, I think there are, regardless of the level of, uh, of, an, of an individual or role within the organization, I think that there are, um, you know, there's an opportunity to ensure um, that, uh, you know, they're effectively trained once again, not only in, um, you know, the organization that they're a part of, um, but, you know, just some, some foundational elements. So if you think about, um, you know, all employees, regardless of their role, there are certain compliance elements that it's critical to make sure that they're trained in, right? Um, HR, legal, um, data compliance, we also deal with, uh, you know, with clinical data. And so we've got that as kind of, you know, there's, there's the, um, you know, just that, that foundational what's needed for them to be able to um, work in a compliant manner in whatever the work environment is. Um, there's that, um, then, you know, what is it that they need to be um, effective in the organization? So less role specific, but how do they do certain things within the organization, which I think, you know, those two, those two layers combined, I think are, are fairly standard for part of, you know, onboarding training, things of that nature. Some of those topics need to be revisited uh, more than just the one time, right, on an annual basis or some level of frequency. But um, but I think that those kind of hold true regardless of what the individual's roles are. Um, as, you know, as, as you kind of build, um, you know, depending on the roles in the organization, as you build within an organization, whether or not, um, you know, someone goes, uh, you know, is, is, is needing to focus more initially on the technical aspects of their role. I already mentioned aseptic technique training, good documentation practices, um, things that are going to be required for them to be able to be, uh, you know, effectively do what they need to do within a, you know, regulated quality system. Um, those are those are really critical. I also think you layer in, you know, by the by by layering in some of these softer skills um, and the opportunity for for individuals to learn and really grow in those areas. I mean, at the end of the day, we're um, we're just, you know, the intention is to give people um, more tools in their tool belt that. Um, you know, ideally they're using when they're part of this organization, but I fully believe that you, um, you, you know, the more that we can build successful um, uh, employees and, and really invest in them, that's, you know, going to live with them as they move on. Um, and I think the more, you know, as, as leaders, it's, it's our job to know that, yes, that may be the case and we still need to develop them anyways, because that is that is part of their career path, and so I think it's I think it's uh, important to just acknowledge that as well. But at the end of the day, it's giving everybody more tools. Well, let me follow on that. So, tools are there tools or models that you tend to utilize? Something you can recommend to those folks listening in today? You know, whether it's something through Microsoft yeah. Teams or, you know, is there something that you can really hand over to folks if they wanted to follow up on this that they can utilize themselves? Yeah, I mean, I, I wish I had, I wish I had a, um, you know, the, the the golden answer on this one. But I mean, at the end of the day, I think the the main thing that we need to acknowledge um, is that everybody has different learning styles, um, and so it we need to be, realize that you know training and learning is not a one size fits all approach. And so I I think that having the opportunity for um, some form of blended learning, whether it be videos and then application, or whether it be going to a conferences and then coming back and presenting out, whether it be reading the documents and then talking about some form of of blended learning to where um, it's, you know, the expectation is that it isn't that they've read the document and therefore they're trained because that's just that's that's not uh, the reality. Um, so um, I, I do think it takes, you know, a little bit of massaging and nuancing to figure out what that right model is, but um, just at the end of the day, understanding it's not going to be just one modality that is effective for, for folks, I think is, is a major win. Yeah, great point. Yeah, yeah, I would add that, um, you know, there's tremendous amounts of training um, resources online, but um, as we all 
know from Zoom fatigue and other effects, just sitting there in front of your computer and trying to learn is, is very one dimensional. Um, you can learn a lot about programming, for example, just by taking some of the Microsoft courses that are freely available. But it's that interaction, human to human interaction, I think that we, um, we're lacking at the moment that we'll get back to. Um, and uh, to Kirsten's point, everyone learns differently. Some folks need to be in person and communicating with another human. Others, you know, maybe more satisfied with taking courses. Um, but what I, I do think is very valuable about um, uh, organizations like CPATH and AZ Bio and others is it are the resources that they provide, right? So as um, folks in this industry think about their careers, going to the organizations that um, have resources for you to understand, you know, what jobs are available, what, what type of skills do I need to, to get a job uh, in the industry. Those are, you know, kind of the external resources that, that I like to point people to is whenever someone comes to me and says, hey, you know, I want to work in a lab, I want to work at a startup in, um, in life sciences, I'll point them to AZ Bio, I'll point them to CPATH, I'll point them to places that have resources for people to learn. Um, but again, that, I think a lot of it, depends on the individual and how they absorb information. Um, and finally, I would say that um, as far as effective tools, um, learning from others about what they use um, to keep their skills sharp is very important. Um, it's kind of that informal uh, cultural thing that you get from working with others in, in a work environment. And you, 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 know, you learn by picking up what other people are doing and what they're good at and try and emulate them. Um, and I think that's part of the soft skills that that um, individuals need to have as they enter a workforce. Great. And for each of your team members, do you have like performance plans? Is there some sort of scorecard dashboard? You know, how do both of you approach that, you know, as an organization that individually uh, for your team members? Yeah, I get, um, for, for us, it, it's a, um, an annual review process. Um, I think most companies have that kind of thing, um, but also, at least in the programs that are more intern focused, um, there's a very defined, I would call it a syllabus, if you will, <laughs> um, where there's a, sp a specific goal or outcome for a, a team project. And, um, you know, folks are evaluated on how they participated in that project. Um, I think goal setting is so critical for um, employees and, and trainees to understand, you know, are they making progress? Are they picking up the skills? Um, so, so for sure, having some sort of metrics at the end to say either annually or as part of projects that complete, how did we do? How did, how did each person do in, in the, um, in their job function? That's, that's definitely part of it. Yes, and we're uh, very similar annual reviews. Um, it is, you know, there's the, you know, the kind of metric driven deliverable milestone goals, as well as um, individual development goals um, that get incorporated um, so that, you know, we are able to continue to, you know, focus um, the development of our individuals kind of over, over the course of the year. Um, so yeah, it really focused on really focused on making sure that that's part of their overall development plan. Great. And a question to both of you: Is your development program an asset when it comes to recruiting new talent? Mm -hmm. I mean, is the word out on the street that that's a good company to go to because I can learn new things, new skills? You know, it's it's a very dynamic organization. Is that a benefit? Is that something that you feel attracts new talent? Yeah, I mean, for, for sure. I mean, the, um, the programming that we have for the internship uh, is a big attract. And I think um, whenever you hear the words artificial intelligence or big data, and then you think of healthcare and life sciences, there are so many people who want to understand that. Um, mm -hmm. And being able to kind of get your hands on actual data and uh, work on it and see how a company deals with uh, big data, uh, very attractive. I think that's, that's the nice thing is it's, for, for some folks, it's not an, um, a thing that they know they want to do, but it becomes, you know, a, a knack or a skill that they pick up through the experience of, um, you know, learning and, and understanding how to deal with data. So I think for us, it's been, it's been great to have a, 
you know, an outwardly facing, hey, here's a program that if you're interested in this kind of work, come, come see what it's all about. And we'll, we'll not only provide the environment and the time to, to help you understand how to work on this kind of um, uh, data, but also for us to be able to evaluate, are, are you a good fit? you know, will you become a great worker mm -hmm. for the company? Will you really excel here? So yes, definitely very valuable. Yeah, I would agree. I, I would say that, you know, maybe less as a recruiting tool um, that it is as an individual recruiting tool um, that, that the training programs, you know, are really kind of help um, anchor employees um, or candidates, but the fact that it is a um, it is a component of what the organization is doing to commit to the success of the employees um, is something that certainly resonates when they think about, you know, what stepping into an environment that is new um, and wanting to make sure that, you know, they're going to be working in, you know, they're, they're going to be joining an organization that will help them be successful and help them kind of thrive. I think understanding that that is a component of what, you know, is available to them. Um, is is certainly is certainly important. Great and a question. I think it came up in one of the chat questions. You know, it, it's no secret that the Phoenix Scottsdale area is booming, and we've got a lot of business growth. And uh, in terms of new hires, you know, what's their state of readiness to fit with your business, your strategy? I know Chris has an internship program, so obviously he's trying to mold and train and gain interest in a group that's that's still in school, but in general, maybe Kristen, for you, are, are people skilled? Are they ready or are they 50% of the way? Or you know, what sort of challenge do you have from that aspect? Yeah, thanks, Jim. That's a great question. And um, I'll say that the support from um, institutions and organizations like you know, City of Phoenix with Claudia and others are really, um, very focused on making sure that downtown becomes downtown Phoenix becomes a very successful place, a place where people want to live and work and thrive. Um, and so students who come out of ASU, for example, um, we need to give them more exposure to what happens inside of a lab. How do companies work? Um, you know, what is it like to transition from, um, you know, kind of the academic world into um, the corporate world. And I would say in, in terms of readiness, we're still a young market for sure. Um, we, um, we aren't yet the places that, you know, have deep, deep uh, bench, as they call it, for um, talent. But um, there's nothing like, you know, kind of the pluckiness of seeing younger workers come in with bright eyes and, and wanting to, you know, do something and, and transform the world. Um, the issue is how quickly can we skill them up in a space that's very technically specialized. Mm -hmm. And from our perspective, um, you know, having them exposed to the, the laboratories, having them exposed to companies where they can do internships, I think is, is a fast way to get them up to speed. Um, I would say that over the next five years, um, downtown Phoenix and Arizona in general, um, including Tucson, including Flagstaff, you know, our, our metropolitan areas will grow with the success of these students who graduate and want to stay, right? Um, and we need to give them more of those kind of job opportunities to do so. And I'll just point out that the city and um, whether it's Phoenix or Scottsdale or Tucson, you know, they have tremendous resources. Um, and I think it's also our job to, to kind of point some of the, the, folks who are interested to those resources and say, you know, go check out this program by the city of Phoenix. AZ Bio is hosting another seminar here. I think that those are, um, those are ecosystem um, uh, cultivation things that I think we can do. Um, but I'm, I'm encouraged. It, it's really great to see the interest and the support. Great. Kristen? So uh, it's interesting. I'm, uh, so I'm going to focus my response here from my time when I was with Core Blood Registry because it, it certainly evolved. You know, we um, so once again, CBR is a um, FDA regulated um, and accredited um, you know uh, uh, organization, manufacturing facility, um, and uh, you know has a kind of tremendous quality system. So 
the um, the fact that um, you know it is, but it, it's it's also in you know stem cell, right? So it's an incredibly attractive kind of um, uh, launching point for um, someone who's just recently graduated with their four year laboratory science degree in cellular molecular biology, right? And they want to go into this field. Um, the the um, challenge that we had to learn over time is you know, individuals that are wanting to kind of move through, you know, and, and into higher levels of whether it be research or um, uh, medical school, um, you know, they're not really conducive to doing the same thing over and over again <laughs> in a repetitive way. Um, they want to do research. They want to be creative. They want to explore. And it's, you know, it's part of the curiosity. It's part of why they got into science. Um, and so it's completely natural. And what we had to come to grips with um, as an organization was, you know, we it, trying to have that be our only kind of um, entry level criteria, a four year laboratory science degree. Um, we were, um, we needed to expand kind of how we thought about who was the right fit for the role and what was that um, right background. Um, and then layer in the in-house training program so that we could make sure that if they weren't coming in with a four-year laboratory science degree, but you know what, they're coming in as a pharmacy technician who is used to doing things in a very quality way, but also doing things very repetitively. Okay, we need to make sure that we kind of marry their background, which is really well suited for um, this type of environment with in-house training and, and that development, because we, we found that we were having, we were having quite a bit of turnover and it was, it was in, in part, and we had to take this on as an organization because we were not appropriately setting the expectation for folks that were coming in, um, that no, this is the role that we need you to fill. And so, um, you know, it, it, it's, it certainly, um, you know, by, by having an effective in-house training program, it, to a certain extent, allows you to rethink the, profile of the employees in that type of environment as well. Um, because, it, it, you know, if, if you're able to train them to deliver effectively what you need to, then maybe you can rethink what you are expecting um, to them to walk in the door with. And actually, maybe it would be more of an advantage because you would decrease their turnover. So it was an interesting um, evolution to go through in that regard. Um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we would somewhat joke that we were the you know, CBR and, and Ventana, we shared quite a bit of employees and we joked that we were the training program for Ventana and then they'd go to Ventana and eventually they come back to CBR and, it, you know, we just it's like, all right. Um, and, uh, and we also had quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of uh, folks who, you know, spent one or two years with the organization. And then that was a really great on a med school application. And so they would go to med school. So, and we couldn't fault, you know, employees for that, but we had to take on, if that was something that we were willing to, that, that, that type of, churn was something we wanted to continue to manage or if we need to be rethinking the profile and layering in then um, the, the training programs so that we could really um, retain and grow the employees in house. Yeah, good point. So I think it, it becomes a combination of talent yeah. development and career yeah. path planning. Yeah. And you have to kind of factor that into your own turnover, staffing yeah. and, uh, and skill set development. No, I totally agree. And I'd say looking at Phoenix, Scottsdale, Tempe, Tucson, with COVID hitting, pop-up COVID testing facilities and labs around were really straining and creating turnover in my situation, losing people because people were getting paid better somewhere else and became a real challenge. And mm -hmm. now you have Wexford downtown and building that whole downtown research campus. There's gonna be an awful lot of job potential here, awful lot of talent management and development potential for companies and organizations. So I think it's, it's the boom, but we're gonna have to keep our eyes on, you know, developing and creating the draw for the young talent mm -hmm. graduating from these universities and, and people moving into town as well. I mean, just mm -hmm. to add on to uh, your, both of your comments, uh, CEI Gateway is downstairs in the, um, I guess they're calling it A50 PBC, so Wexford building. Um, and they're creating a, a, a lab force program where they're gonna help continue the training of some of these folks who are interested in the life sciences. I think that's fantastic, right? It's, um, to your point, Jim, it's like, how do you retain the talent? How do you keep them um, at the companies for a long enough period of time where they've gained great skills? So it's not just, um, 
them jumping from resume builder to resume builder, or maybe to med school, um, or go work for a company in San Diego. It's, I like being here in this environment. And I like, you know, working at um, cord blood registry, and then, hey, there's Ventana, and then, hey, there's Ordinatrix. And then, Mm -hmm. you know, having that ability to feel very satisfied with your career path. I think that's, um, that's coming. I think it's, it's building here. Yeah, and you know, I asked you this question earlier, both of you, but I, I see this as nothing but an asset. And if your organization, even if you do have turnover, somebody who is left who can turn to somebody else and say, yes, I recommend go to work. It was the best three years of my life. It was akin to getting another PhD or a PhD in real world experience. It's a great team because that'll keep people coming back to you. I mean, it serves you well, right? Because people are your biggest asset. You can't get it done by yourself. So um, those are all great points. Thank you both on that. Uh, Joan, have we gone over our, you want to open up to Q&A? So great conversation, everybody. That was terrific. And um, we have been watching the chat. So I have, you know, a couple of different pieces. Um, Chris, you you stole one of my lead-ins because our May... Um, AZ Bio Peer session is actually going to be talking about LabForce and looking at that system and that program. So that's terrific. Um, looking at the chat, a couple of the things that um, have come up. One, and I'm going to pick on Chris on this one. Um, we have a lot of conversations about internships and the need for internships, the importance of internships. Um, in your past experience, about what percentage of those interns actually migrated over to employees? Yeah, I mean, at uh, one point, I think we had, again, 13 people and only three of us were, did not do, you know, come from the internship program. Uh, startups are a little different in that things move very quickly. Uh, of course, many, many of you know already that talent comes in quickly, talent also leaves quickly. Um, but at one point we had, quite a few and we, we relied on the internship program. And I think it was because of the, the type of work that we did. Um, so highly specialized, you know, had to learn machine learning, dealing with big data, dealing with healthcare life sciences information. Um, yeah, it, it, it required extra skill and therefore getting people who came in through the internship program um, was natural, you know, it was natural to continue them along in their career path. Thanks. And, um, you know, Kristen, you were breaking new ground, right? You, there was nothing like CBR, not just in Tucson, but anywhere as you guys were building that. Um, and, you know, Chris, big data, <laughs> you know, we, we didn't have big data in life science a decade ago like we do today, right? We weren't dealing with AI and a lot of the other things or only the pioneers like, like you were. Um, when we look at creating a blueprint for talent development, um, you know, we have the challenge that our, our community is not homogenous, right? Each company has very unique things that they mm-hmm. need to focus on. But what would you say are the three or four things that should be in everybody's blueprint? Christian, you want to start? I mean, I think first and foremost, you need to, and Chris has touched on this, you need to make sure that you've really thought about what is the objective, right? What is the end goal that you're looking to achieve, Um, whether it be in the product that you're looking to deliver, what you're looking to develop, um, you know, what what is the life cycle of um, a, a, a new employee that you're bringing in? I think you, I think that needs to, um, that needs to then provide the framework for um, what opportunities and how you structure your your training programs because there is that kind of standard what they need to be able to you know be effective in the company or the organization what they need to be effective in their job and then what they need to continue to grow into that kind of next layer of their career and so I think that takes different shapes and different forms depending on the organization and um, the individuals. Chris? Yeah I would um, add that focusing in again on the soft skills um, it, yeah. I, I've seen 
some brilliant people just unable to um, interact in a team fashion and, and today's work, um, especially in yeah. the technology field requires you to interact with others and share information and, and uh, work together closely. So that kind of collaborative aspect you know, going from, and you know, for us, it's a lot of younger folks, of course, who um, come out of college, recently graduated, um, understanding that it's not just about a grade, <laughs> and it's more about, you know, team dynamic-wise, are you achieving goals that have been set out for you, or that you as a team have set out for yourselves? Um, I think it, it can be overwhelming sometimes to to be thrust into a real-world job. Um, setting and that those softer skills, I think, are, are key things that need to be part of any training program. And Jim, you're not a neophyte in this area either. What do you think? You, you know, I think sometimes you can be too internally focused and you forget that everybody in the organization has an impact on the end user, the customer, right? Even if you're in accounting, you know, do you understand that customer's cash flow, or whatever? But if we're talking about a real product, I think whether it's a life-saving biologic drug, do you understand that patient? Do you understand those parents, the treaters, the caregivers? Um, or if it's analysis on drug utilization, do your people have an understanding of the chief medical officer, or head of pharmacy, or uh, you know, that understand why that data is important to their success? So I think everybody in the organization should have some element in their development that has a focus on the outside world, and whether it's competitors, because that's who we're going to compete with. You might not have a job if we don't deliver something of greater value. Uh, do you understand what this means to a patient and their quality of life and their survival? So I think there's an outside element we need to kind of pull inside a little more often so people can reflect on how they truly have an impact and have value, especially if we're in healthcare related fields, right? So that's just a, my, my angle on that. Mm -hmm. Great. So um, tools, we talked about some of the traditional tools, tools right? The skills-based tools, project management skills and technical skills and regulatory skills and all of those things that are truly unique to our industry. When you're building teams to assess fit or dealing with a team that's not functioning at full potential because of fit. Um, have you ever used any um, assessment tools, you know, that are used by psychologists, trainers, workforce people, whether it's yeah. Colby or the FIRO B to help people understand themselves and help a team understand the team overall? Christian, you're nodding. Yeah, I think, uh, yes, um, I think I've gone through just about all of them at this point, <laughs> and they are quite helpful, actually. Every every single time we go through something like that, it, it is quite helpful. I mean, uh, you know, 10 years ago, it was MBTI. Um, five years ago, it was DISC, um, and we would go through DISC. Um, most recently, about a year and a half ago, um, we went through uh, what's called Lumina Spark, um, and so, uh, it, that was, that was as part of CPATH, um, but it was something that was brought in by, um, our former CEO who had gone, they had done it with, through Bayer. So, I mean, it, it, you know, big pharma. Um, so, I, you know, I think at the end of the day, they, you know, the, the intention be behind a lot of those tools, um, which is, is extremely helpful, um, is it helps you understand a little bit more about yourself, but it also, you know, if they're if they're if they're good tools, they help you understand more about your colleagues and how what I am doing or how I am interacting may or may not be a fit for them and vice versa. And so what are those things that I can be doing differently or they can be doing differently so that um, there's, um, you know, it helps to enhance our effectiveness as a unit or as a team. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent of, of having those types of, um, uh, going through those types of exercises or tools, um, because you'll always walk away with something um, that, is, that is new and, and is helpful um, in understanding the team dynamic. Chris? Yeah, I, uh, I totally agree. I mean, the personality tests are, are fascinating. And often you, you learn more about yourself than the employee that you're yeah. with on it. Um, but I, it's kind of interesting and on a tangent, I learned from some of the students, uh, book clubs of all things, 
um, as just an example tool. Learning by uh, reading together, uh, say a book like um, uh, Ben Horowitz's The Hard Thing About Hard Things, you know, it's like there are um, classic experiences out there that others have written about um, work, how, how your career develops, you know, uh, working in a startup, things like that, that are great resources that in a team fashion you learn from, right? And so it's that kind of continuing education, I think that makes people very happy. Um, they feel like their careers are, are moving forward and using tools like, you know, where can we learn together about um, some new technique or some experience that others who've had. Um, book club of all things um, is one of the tools that, that has become very useful. I think bringing people together and learning together. And, and in terms, sorry, and in terms of like evaluating how have they done? Um, yeah, I think it's the performance reviews, um, one-on-ones and understanding how a manager and an, an employee interact and making sure that that's a very productive interaction. Jim? Uh, just to, uh, to build on what Chris just said, I think people think of performance reviews, uh, it's kind of a 180 process. They fill out all the forms and you tell them what they were great at, what they need some development on, and maybe some, some actions you need to take to address some issues with that person. But I think it is a 360, right? And, and both sides need to, to be open that need improvement, need some new understanding to make the whole team function better. And that's sometimes hard for people to understand as a manager, or you, know, you think you're the boss, but I think you have to be open to that. I mean, that's how you truly develop talent. You know, they, they see that we're all part of a learning process. We're all growing, the marketplace is moving and we're all gonna move with it. And there's no exceptions. And you know, it's interesting, when I first came to Arizona many years ago, um, it was to build an operation where we were literally hiring out of universities a um, hundred student cohorts per quarter. And so the training of that and having each cohort at a different stage was a, a major challenge, to put it mildly. Um, and one of the things that we established when we were scaling was learning circles. So each cohort had a learning circle and they met every two weeks and they talked about what they experienced, what they were learning, what skill gaps they were finding as they were integrating into their new roles, um, which helped us determine what training was needed as opposed to the um, training methodology of the day fad, which was very popular back then. Um, so, you know, having that group interaction so they were co-producers of their training um, was a, a huge win for us. Um, and it also got us that, you know, it, that immediate feedback. One of the things that was really interesting was many of these students wanted public speaking skills. And we ended up developing Toastmasters in-house because we had enough people to do it in-house. Um, because that was a skill set that they felt that they needed not only to progress with their career, but to communicate with their peers. So you can learn from those things. We are coming up on our, the end of our session, um, and I'd like to, to really you know, thank all three of our presenters today. Um, but I also want to give you, before I wrap things up, you know, a closing thought. And Jim, why don't we start with you? If there was one takeaway, what would it be? I think you, you need to, uh, to take learning to heart. I think it's an organizational dynamic and everybody needs to think about that because it's important to not just that individual, but it's that career path. It's not just a skill. It's not just harassment training and you know, some of these basics today. This is about building a strong mm -hmm. thinking organization that people are, uh, have great satisfaction in working for and it's reflected the customers see it. That's the thing. If you can do that right, customers see it and it pays great dividends. Great, thank you. Kristen. Yeah, I, I would agree with Jim. You know, I, I think that a, the, a main takeaway is the importance of having these opportunities. Um, and, and as leaders in an organization offering this, uh, 
these opportunities to um, our workforce to continue to hone and develop um, within their existing roles. Um, and then also that, you know, it can't just be lip service. It's, it's got to be something, you know, it's got to be structured in a way um, and geared towards um, really enhancing, um, you know, what is needed for that individual and at that particular time. So um, for it to really be, be um, powerful. So uh, making sure that it's, it's, um, it's, it, 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 it is something that is um, flexible um, to the current dynamics. Chris? Yeah, and I'll just dovetail on that to say um, it's, part of our responsibility as managers and executives to encourage that training is seen as a positive, right? It's not a, it's not a chore. It's not something that people should, you know, roll their eyes at. Um, as Jim pointed out, constant learning. And as Kristen said, make it tangible, make it, make some outcome uh, that feels really good for employees such that they see their career path growing and, and their relationship with the organization is strong. So that, that means, really giving training the kind of respect that it needs um, as, a, as a corporate function. Awesome. Thank you so much. And, you know, relative to recruitment, don't forget to put in your recruitment messages that you put out on whatever platform you use um, that we are a, a learning organization and we provide training as a benefit because training is a benefit, not a chore. Um, Great conversation today. I want to remind everyone who joined us today or who's watching the video replay um, that the next session is going to be on practical tools that you can use and specifically what was developed here in Arizona, LabForce. So join us um, in May for a continuation of this discussion. Also in June at the Bio International Convention, um, the Council of State Bioscience Institutes, of which AZBio is a founding member, will release its biennial um, workforce report, which is going to look at what are the skill sets and um, the talent trends that we're seeing in Arizona and across the country. So uh, May, you're going to learn about workforce um, and lab force, and in June, we'll be sharing via In the Loop. Um, what we found out in the national study, which many of our companies participated in. So make it a good week. Have a great month. Thank you for everything that you do to make life better for people in Arizona, in the United States, and around the world. And join us next month for the next session of AZ Bio Peers. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.